Okay, we're back. Let's talk a little bit about Gothic art. You might ask yourself, what is a, what is Gothic art? We know what art is, but where did the term Gothic come from? Actually, it came from the art historian or historian Vasari in the 1500s, and it refers to not this particular type of architecture per se that's based on the pointed arch. You'll see it with a lot of the great cathedrals instead of a Roman arch, which is rounded. It uh, points toward the Visigoths, which were, think Vikings. We won't go into the history of everything, but think Vikings and the tribes that overran the Roman Empire during the 600s. Um, that's where Vasari was, was looking back. It was a, their architecture was kind of a, uh, an architecture with that, that was out of its own time. It was debased from something that had come from before. It wasn't looking backward as much. Um, so let's take it from there. Let's take a, uh, a look at what Gothic quote unquote means, how it was established, and to figure out how it established, we have to do a little bit of a history lesson. So we have to start with the Holy Roman Empire. Well, what the heck is that? So think Charlemagne, uh, Charles the First, or Charles the Great, who was the first emperor after the fall of the Romans. Uh, he came about 300 years after the fall of the Romans, but he was the first emperor, Western emperor in Europe uh, after the fall of the Romans. So this is the first big great kingdom after the great kingdom that came from the Romans. Well, his son, Louis the Pious, uh, the Carolinian Empire then was split up into a whole bunch of different pieces and power was passed over to the Ottonians, who were named after Otto the Great. They, they, he's the first one. So Otto the First, Otto the Great, they named everything after that, the Ottonians. These were your Saxon rulers uh, that were around modern-day Germany. Okay, The years we don't worry about. We're talking the year 900. This is a while back. Okay, And the, the key thing here is that the reason why we get the Holy Roman Empire is because we have the union with Otto the First. We have the union of Germany and Italy under German rule. Think about what goes forward. This is the year 962. Go forward, what a thousand years from there, just a little under a thousand years, and now you're talking 1941, 39, that sort of thing. Germany and Italy, their buddies still, that sort of a thing. We get this Holy Roman Empire that goes with it. Just for reference sake, here's a representation of Louis the Pious, Charlemagne's son. Here's a reference. This is a reference, a depiction of Charlemagne done by Albert Durer in 1512. Nowhere near the time of actual Charlemagne. Like we said before, Charlemagne was also known as Charles I or Charles the Great. And then just for giggles, here's a uh, depiction, a sculpture that is supposed to represent Otto I. Pretty good hair. Okay, so with the Ottonian, the Ottonian period, this is what we get. We get a, a looking back to specifically Roman architecture that was Christian-based, um, not based off of like your Greek and Roman gods, your Zeus and Hera and those things and things that we've already talked about. You have a focus on book work. These things were created in monasteries. Uh, you get the, the invention of the printing press that came about and the spreading of the word. Where was that done? That was started in the monasteries. You get very, very, very heavy liturgical imagery. So uh, Bible-based, uh, Christian-based. Uh, imagery, but we also see some like politics that go in with it because we have this connection between uh, church and state. We have the the Holy Roman Empire. We have the connection between the emperors and the church. Whether you say the church was pulling strings or emperors were pulling strings in the church, that's we're not worrying about it for our sake. But it it did solidify that relationship between the church and the emperors that would go on for quite some time. And there you go. Here's here's the big one. We've talked patronage a little bit. We'll talk about it even more as we move forward. The Ottonians, what they did is they set up the church to be a major patron for the visual arts. Now, why does that matter? 
during this time, even though the, the printing press has been around for a little while, you're talking, it, it was it, the printing press was going to be coming with the invention from Gutenberg. Anybody before then, unless you were of the privilege, you did not know how to read. And so imagery, pictures, were what pushed forward the message whatever message you were trying to portray. One of the big messages was that of the church. So how did they do it? They did it through books that were primarily pictures. They did it with carvings. They did it with sculptures. They did it with stations of the cross inside the church itself. As you go around the inside of a church, even now today, there's usually, if it's a Catholic church, we're talking Roman Catholic here. This is that time period, the church was the Roman Catholic Church. You see, you'll see different stations of the cross, which is the the steps that Christ had taken from the, his time of his arrest till he get got all the way through the crucifixion and then the ascension afterwards. You can see these images, and whether they were paintings or carvings or whichever, and you can understand the message without having to read the words on a page. So in some ways, without being, this isn't a anti-religious statement or in any way, shape or form, blasphemous in any way, shape or form, uh, the great cathedrals can be looked at as a giant, living, solid, three-dimensional picture book. Everything had a symbol, everything had a place, and the viewers, the congregation was meant to come in and look at that and feed off of that message and it was reinforced everywhere they looked. So let's look just at a few things. What you see on your screen is a, a piece that is Otto the First, who we've talked about, and he's presenting his cathedral, one of his big cathedrals in his area, uh, in Magdeburg Cathedral, which is in Germany, and he's presenting it to Christ after it was uh, created. This particular piece was actually part of a larger set of pieces, about 17 pieces, that was probably part of a pulpit or like a screen, a divider, or part of an altar. Uh, there was a fire during the 1000s, so they, the art historians don't have it pinned, but during the 1000s, so do the math um, and they were split up and made into reliquaries and book covers so possibly the holes that are in this were bolted to a piece of or bolted is kind of a loose word attached uh, nailed to a piece of wood that then was part of a book cover possibly um, or it was part of a reliquary which wood is a, a small container that holds a sacred object whether it be um, oh, part of Christ's uh, the shroud of Turin so the, the 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 cloth that he was wrapped in when he was put in the in the tomb before the before he rose from the dead uh, it could be part of um, you know a, a saint's bone uh, from their finger or anything like that there's any there's somebody's hair there's loads of things that it could be but they held these sacred objects, whoever the patron saint of a particular church would be. This particular piece, if you look at it, we can see symbols that are carried out throughout, uh, if you were to read the Bible, but also if you were to, uh, if you couldn't read, you could see it in the picture. So what do we have here? We have Christ in the middle. We can tell by, if you see his halo, that's around him, and he has the cross behind him. The guys to the right, they're kind of his posse. We'll talk about especially one of them. You have a few of the um, apostles, one in particular that we can identify 100%, but we'll get to them in a second. So we have Christ, and he has the book. And uh, on the left, we have Otto I. He's the little short guy. Uh, he is depicted smaller, so he looks like he is... Uh, in front of the guy who is behind him, but also he is depicted smaller because he is a humble servant of Christ. So he is, he is, it's almost like he is bowing down and he has the church in his hand, like a model of the church that he's uh, presenting to uh, Christ for, um, for his blessing. And then right behind 
Otto, the little bit short guy, kind of has his arm around him. That's St. Maurice. St. Maurice is the patron saint of Magdeburg Cathedral. And I'll show you something about him in just a second. And then we have one of Christ's angels that is helping guide them and deliver them to Christ. Because you don't, you know, you don't just walk in and say, hey, to Christ. So you have Otto I presenting the, ca the cathedral to Christ. And on the right, you have one particular person, the person that the church was built upon. So if you ever see something and you see Christ with his, with his posse, if there's a guy that's holding keys, it's Peter. Because Peter was given the keys. He was where, what the church was built upon. So if you ever see a guy, he's right here in the front, and he's got keys in his hand. So that's usually Peter. This little guy is St. Maurice. St. Maurice is an interesting cat. He's not your normal saint for a number of reasons. One, he comes from a very non-Christian, traditionally non-Christian area of the world. He was a legionnaire in the armies of the Pope. And he is a Moor. He is from Northwest Africa, usually reserved for Muslims. But either through conversion or his own choice, he was Christian and was in the Crusades. And they were in a battle where it matters not. And the, they were battling the Muslims at the time to, in hopes of converting them, part of the Crusades. And the opposing army had told all of the legionnaires that they needed to sacrifice to their god for, for a thanksgiving. Not our type of thanksgiving, but a, a thanksgiving a pledge to their god. And the legionnaires refused. So they were outnumbered. So the Muslims said every tenth man will be killed. So every tenth man they killed. They said sacrifice to our god for thanksgiving. The legionnaires said no again. So they sacrificed every tenth man again. And then by this time, they're running pretty low. The Muslims just wiped out all the rest of the legionnaires. One of them was St. Maurice. St. Maurice is, he is depicted as a single person, but he also represents all the legionnaires that would not bow down to a, uh, a different religion. He's the patron saint of some kind of oddball things. Uh, clothing dyers, so people that change the color of your clothes. Swordsmiths, the military, that makes sense. Um, he also protects against things like gout. So if you have the gout, you if you believe in the, the sanctity and the power of the saints, you pray to a particular patron saint. So if you have gout, you pray to St. Maurice, and supposedly he would help cure you. Or cramps of any sort. If you have any sort of stomach ailment or cramps, he would help with that too. Why, I'm not so sure. He's usually depicted in traditional garb of a legionnaire. Sometimes he'll have a red cross on his chest as depicting a specific regiment and that sort of thing. And he's always depicted with a black face. Take that back. He's almost always depicted with a black face because of where he was from in Northwest Africa during that time. People that live in Northwest Africa were not Anglo-Saxon looking like they were from Europe or England or that sort of thing with white pigmented Caucasian skin. They were usually of traditional African descent. So he is one of the only uh, African with a black face saints. <laughs>